Hi, everybody. Um, glad to have you all back for our next to last installment of Theory of Computation. Today, um, we are going to embark on the very last um, big topic for the semester. And that is in some ways going to be following on what we um, started uh, a couple of lectures back when we looked at probabilistic Turing machines and probabilistic computation and its associated class BPP. Now what we're going to discuss is in some sense a probabilistic version of NP. Um, and that's going to be a complexity class called IP, which stands for Interactive Proof Systems. Um, and so we're going to present that model and look at a couple of examples. Uh, I would just like to say at the beginning that the, uh, this model is a very important one. It's really uh, has been the starting point for a great deal of uh, research um, in complexity theory. So we're just really going to be touching on it, but uh, there's a lot more that people have um, pursued with this model. And it's also a connection into the cryptography field, uh, which uh, also makes use of the interactive proof system model. In fact, um, some of the um, uh, genesis of that model comes out of cryptography, where you're having uh, multiple parties either communicating or uh, in some ways uh, interacting uh, to achieve certain uh, goals of communication or signing or passwords or, or, or what have you. So uh, this is a, both a, an applied area and also one that has a, a lot of very interesting theory uh, um, associated to it. So with that one, we we're gonna jump in um, and uh, start out by uh, making myself smaller <laughs> and uh, just do a, an introduction. Um, I'm gonna introduce the model or the, the concept of an interactive proof with an example. And that example involves the graph isomorphism problem. That's the problem of testing whether two graphs are isomorphic. What we mean by two graphs being isomorphic is that they're really just the same graph uh, with one of them perhaps being relabeled or permuted um, so that uh, uh, they may look superficially different. They may appear with a different sequence of labels or the nodes are appearing in a different order. But um, uh, except for that, it's really just the same graph. So I'm kind of illustrating that here. If you can see those two graphs here, which look different from each other, uh, both on eight nodes, they are in fact the same graph. Um, as I can illustrate by a little animation, which will convert this one into that one. Um, so uh, the um, so the two graphs, um, these graphs being the same, um, they're we call that isomorphic. So these are graphs G and H, and they're really the same graph. So we, we um, call them isomorphic graphs, and we. Uh, are, have an associated computational problem called ISO, which is uh, given a pair of graphs. We'd like to know are they isomorphic or not. So the ISO is the collection of pairs of graphs which are isomorphic. And um, it's easy uh, to see that this problem is an NP problem because uh, all you need to do in order to see or to give a certificate that the two graphs are isomorphic to each other is tell you, is just to say which nodes in the one graph correspond to which other nodes in the other graph. Um, and then you, all you need to check is that the edge relationships are consistent with that uh, mapping or that isomorphism as it's called. Um, so it's easy to see that the ISO problem is in NP. And if you're not getting that, make sure you uh, understand uh, because this is the whole first part of the lecture will be lost if you don't understand this ISO problem. 
Now, the question of whether um, you can test two graphs being isomorphic in polynomial time um, is not clear. And in fact, that's an unsolved problem to this day. Uh, and it's a problem that has generated an enormous literature. Uh, there, there are hundreds of papers on the graph isomorphism problem, as it's called, um, to try to uh, resolve, um, you know, uh, to try to see if one can find a polynomial time algorithm. And in fact, it was a very big result just in the last 10 years where there was a sub-exponential algorithm given that, so that was more, um, that faster than the brute force search approach, but didn't get it all, all the way down to polynomial. Now, why is there so much attention just to this one particular NP problem? It's because it's not known whether the graph isomorphism problem is NP complete. ISO is not known to be an NP complete problem. And that puts it into a very, very small class of problems in NP, which are no, not known to be either NP or NP complete. It's kind of a curiosity that for NP problems, almost all of them have ended up being in one side or the other. And in fact, um, it's a, uh, um, uh, in fact, the, the um, I, I, I think it's the only problem that just involves graphs that's not known to be either in P or in NP. Um, so so I, I got a question here, what, what would be in between exponential and polynomial? For example, I, I don't remember what the, the bound is, but it's, it's something in the, uh, uh, in the range of N to the log N. Uh, t uh, time complexity for the graph isomorphs. I may be getting that wrong. Um, I, I don't remember exactly what the bound is, but um, you, you, that's significantly better than two to the n or some uh, some exponential amount of time. But it, it's more than n to any constant, so it's more than any polynomial time. Um, so. Um, Another question uh, of the same sort is whether the complementary problem is in NP or whether, whether ISO is in co-NP or let's, let's talk about it in terms of the complement, whether the uh, complement of ISO, which I'll refer to as the non-ISO problem, whether that's known to be in NP. So that's also not known. Um, uh, in other words, if I give you two graphs and I ask you to show that they're not isomorphic, Suppose they aren't isomorphic and you go through the effort of you know, determining that by a brute force search and now you want to prove that they're not isomorphic. Well, that's not, uh, it's not known to be an NP either. So there's no known short certificate, certificate of two graphs not being isomorphic. We don't know how to do that either. But there's something that's very interesting nevertheless. Um, and it has to do with the ability to, for one party to prove to another that graphs are either isomorphic or not isomorphic. So if you're just having like a prover, we haven't really been necessarily formulating that this way so much in this class, but this is a completely equivalent way of formulating the notion of NP, whether you have a polynomial time verifier and a prover who can produce certificates, say it's a powerful prover, so um, if you have a problem that's in NP, a prover can convince a polynomial time verifier that uh, strings are in the language if in fact they are. So in the case of uh, the ISO problem, a prover can convince a polynomial time verifier the graphs are isomorphic just by exhibiting the isomorphism. Now, for the non-isomorphism case, we don't know that that problem's in NP. But it's still possible for a prover to convince a verifier that graphs are not isomorphic. If you change the rules of the game slightly. Um, so even though the non-ISO problem is not known to be an NP, a prover can still convince a polynomial time verifier that graphs are not isomorphic, assuming they, they are in fact not isomorphic, um, provided the um, the prover and the verifier can interact with one another. So the verifier can ask questions of the prover and the verifier gets to be probabilistic. 
So that's in this in this in the, that's in sense in which I mean that this notion is a kind of a probabilistic version of NP. Okay, so um, let me show you how that's done. So before we jump in to the uh, to the method for a prover to um, show a verifier that graphs are not isomorphic, um, let me let, let's try to get a little clearer on the model. So I'm going to first show it to you informally, and then we'll look at it formally. Okay, so in in interactive proofs, there are two parties. Um, and I'm gonna think about them as one of them is gonna be the professor. Okay, so the professor is gonna play the role of the verifier in a sense, but you know, it's like the, the one who checks. Um, and uh, the professor being kind of old and tired, it's been teaching too long maybe, uh, can only operate in probabilistic polynomial time. So the professor, if he wants to tell whether two graphs are isomorphic or not, probabilistic polynomial time doesn't seem to be enough to tell whether two graphs are isomorphic or not, because it seems to be a more than polynomial problem. However, the professor has um, help. It has an army of graduate students. And the graduate students, they're not limited uh, in the same way the professor is. The graduate students are young. They um, uh, are energetic. They can stay up all night. They know how to code. So the graduate students have unlimited computational ability. So that we're gonna think of the graduate students playing the role of the prover because they're not, they're not limited in their capabilities, we'll assume. The professor, on the other hand, is limited. So the professor wants to know if the two graphs are isomorphic, let's say, whatever they are, um, can't do it by himself. So he's going to ask his students to figure out the answer um, and report back. Now, there's only one problem. The professor knows that students uh, well, in the old days, they liked to party. I guess these days they like to play on, uh, <laughs> play computer games a lot. And so they're not really that eager to spend all their time figuring out whether graphs are isomorphic. So he's worried that the, that the students will just come up with some answer and figure that he won't be able to tell the difference. So the professor does not trust the students. It's not enough to, for the professor to give the problem to the students and just take any answer that they're going to give. The professor wants, a, wants to be convinced. Okay, so um, now, how could the students convince the professor of the answer that they've really done the work and figured out whether the graphs are isomorphic or not? Well, if the graphs are isomorphic, if it turns out that the graphs were isomorphic and the students figure that out, um, then life is good because what are they gonna do to convince the professor? They're gonna hand over the isomorphism and show, yeah, I mean, it, they are, uh, you know, those graphs really are isomorphic and here's how the correspondence works. Professor can check, oh yeah, I, now, I, now, now, now I'm convinced. But suppose the graphs were not isomorphic. What are we going to do then? Um, the, the, the students have figured out graphs are not isomorphic. And the professor wants, wants to be convinced. Oh, no. What are we going to do? Well, in fact, we're going to engage. The, the, the professor and the students are going to engage in the following protocol, a dialogue. What's going to happen is, now you, you have to make sure you're, you're I mean, this is critical to, follow, to understand this little story part of the story here, because it's really going to set the pattern for everything in today's and tomorrow and uh, today's lecture and the, and, and the next lecture. Okay, so the, the, we're going to engage in a following interaction between the students and the professor, which is going to enable the students to convince the professor that the two graphs really are not isomorphic. So how is that going to work? 
This is a, this is a beautiful little uh, thing, by the way. Um, so the professor is going to take the two graphs and pick one of them at random. So has the two graphs, G and H. Um, let's say they're, they're not, they really are not, not isomorphic. The professor doesn't know that for sure. That's what the students claim. The professor really wants to know, be convinced that the students are right. Um, so the professor is going to pick one of the two at random, randomly permute that, uh, that choice, the one that he picked, and hand it over to the students. Say, okay, here is one of those two graphs randomly scrambled. Then I'm going to ask the students, which one did I pick? Okay, now, if the graphs were really not isomorphic, the students can check whether that randomly scrambled graph is isomorphic to either G or to H. It's going to be isomorphic to one or the other. And then the students can figure it out and they say, oh, you picked G or no, you picked H as the case may be. The students can figure that out. But if the graphs were isomorphic, then that scrambled version of G or H could equally well have come from either of them. And the students would have no way of knowing which one the professor picked. So the, there's nothing they could do which would be better than guessing. So if we do that a bunch of times, the professor picks at random, sometimes because secretly, of course, uh, picks uh, the grip, picks either G or picks H. And the students get it right every time. Either the students are really doing the work and the graphs are really not isomorphic or the students are just incredibly lucky. They're managing to guess right, let's say a hundred times. So how would the, the, the professor randomly and secretly picks G or H, uses its, uses its probabilism, flips a coin, just a two-sided coin and says, okay, sometimes they're gonna do G, sometimes they're gonna do, do H, just completely at random, picks one or the other. And then with some more randomness, gets, finds a random permutation of the one that he picked and then sends that over to the students and say, which one did it come from? Um, so I'm not sure. Okay, so let's pause here. Let's, well, let's make sure we all understand this because this is really important. Um, so I'm getting a question here. How, how do we know? I'm not sure what your question is. Um, okay, so let me just say, yeah, the, the professor is going to play the role of the verifier, the graduate students play the role of the prover that's coming, but I really want to understand this protocol here. Okay, so how is the professor picking the graph skin? If you have a Okay, I don't, you know, picking the graphs at random. You have just two graphs. They're a part of the input. Uh, the, both the students and the professor can see the graphs. And the professor is just picking one of them at random using a coin. So I'm not sure I understand the question there. Could P and V be engaged in a protocol where the secretary is on the prover side instead? The question of revealing the isomorphism, I, there is no iso. I'm not sure I understand this question either. Um, maybe we'll make this clear, you know, if, for... For this little illustration, the professor doesn't know the graphs could be isomorphic or they could be not isomorphic. And so uh, the professor wants to be convinced either way, whatever the students, whatever answer the students come up with. We're going to shift this into a problem about a, um, deciding a language next. But right now, I'm just trying to give a sense of the, how the model works. I want to move from this informal model, and now I'm going to formalize that in terms of um, model which will be deciding a language. Okay, so uh, so the interactive proof system model, we have two interacting parties, a verifier, which is probabilistic polynomial time playing played by the professor in the previous slide, and the prover, which is unlimited computational power played by the students in the previous slide. Um, both of them get to see the input, which in the previous case, well, it, it could be, for example, the pair of graphs. Um, 
they exchange a polynomial number of polynomial size messages. So the whole exchange, um, including the verifier's own computation, is going to be polynomial. The only thing that's not, not, not included within the uh, computational cost is the prover's work, which is unlimited. Um, after that, the verifier, after the interaction, the verifier will accept or reject. And we're going to define the probability that the verifier, together with a particular prover, ends up accepting as you um, look over the different possible coin tosses of the verifier, which could lead to different um, uh, behavior on the part of the verifier and therefore different behavior on the part of the prover. So over all the different possibil possibilities for the verifier's computation, we're gonna look at the probability that the verifier with this particular prover ends up accepting. And I've written it this way. This is the probability of the verifier interacting with the prover accepts the input is just simply that. Um, and so we're, we're gonna work through an example. Uh, we're gonna uh, work through the previous example more uh, precisely in a second. The class IP for interactive proofs stands for, it's the class of languages such that for some verifier and approver, um, for strings in the language, the prover makes the verifier accept with high probability. And here's the interesting part. For strings not in the language, the prover makes it accept with low probability, but every there's no prover which can make it accept with high probability. So there's no way to cheat. If you think about it in the case of the graph isomor non-isomorphism, there's nothing, you know, if, if the graphs were really isomorphic and the students were trying to, in a devious way, prove through that protocol that they're not isomorphic, they would fail because there's nothing they can do. If the graphs were isomorphic, then um, when the verifier, the, pro the professor picks one or the other at random um, and scrambles it, the students would have no way of telling which one the professor uh, did. So no matter what kind of scheme they try to come up with, they're gonna be out of luck. So it's no for any strategy, for strings that are not in the language, for any, any prover, I'm calling that P with a tilde to stand for a devious or crooked prover. For any uh, possibly crooked prover, even that with working with the verifier is still going to end, end up accepting with low probability. So strings in the language, there's gonna be an honest prover who just follows the protocol um, in the correct way, which makes the verifier accept with high probability. For strings not in the language, every prover is going to fail to make it accept with high probability. Um, okay, so that, I mean, the way I like to think about it is that P tilde is a possibly crooked prover, which is trying to make the verifier accept when it shouldn't because the string is not in the language. It's like, you know, the, it's like even, you can think of this in the case of um, satisfiability. Um, you know, it, it, you, a crooked prover might try to convince the verifier that the formula is satisfiable when it isn't by, by somehow trying to produce a satisfying assignment, but that's gonna be impossible. There's nothing any strategy can possibly work when the formula is not satisfiable if that's what the verifier is gonna check. It's gonna be looking for that satisfying assignment. Okay. And by the way, this is, a, we're not going to prove this, but it's really gonna be proved in the same way. You can make that one third error that, could, that occurs here something very tiny by the same kind of repetition argument. Okay, so let's see. Um, so why can't the prover in the first case be uh, crooked? Um, the prover in the first case would could be crooked, but that's not gonna serve the purposes. Um, you know, what, what, what we wanna show, um, you know, think about it like we think about NP. For strings in the language, there exists a certificate. There is a proof that you're in the language. So if somebody is going to not produce the proof, 
it, it, that's irrelevant. The question is, if you look at the best possible case, the best possible prover, um, you know, who's going to be, be able, we're asking, does there exist a way to convince the verifier that the um, string is in the language? So it doesn't matter that there might be some other uh, silly way that doesn't work. We're just looking at the best possible way. So the best possible way when you're in the language is going to end up with the verifier having high probability. When you're not in the language, the best possible way is still going to end up with low probability. When, when, when I talk about best possible, I'm trying to maximize the probability that the verifier is going to end up accepting. Let's continue. Uh, not sure as clear as I would like, but... Um, Maybe again, we're going to we're going to stick with that example because this is a very um, uh, helpful example and to try to un understand the setup. Um, and uh, so we're going to I'm going to revisit that previous example about non isomorphism, but now in the context of this thinking about it as a language. So we're going to take this non isomorphism. Um, Uh, yeah, we're going to take the non-isomorphism problem and show that it's an IP. So there's going to be a verifier together with a prover, which are going to make the verifier accept with high probability for strings in the language, namely graphs not being isomorphic. And nothing, there's going to be no way to make the verifier accept with high probability for strings out of the language. Therefore, that's when the graphs are isomorphic. Okay. Um, so the protocol is just going to, we're going to repeat the following thing twice. You know, I, I said in the previous case, do it a hundred times just to help us think about it, but actually twice is going to be enough to get the bound we need. So the verifier is going to operate like this in terms of this is the verifiers in first communicating, sending messages to the prover. It's going to randomly choose G or H, just like what the professor did last time, randomly permute the result to get a new graph K, which was going to be, which was, which is isomorphic either to G or H, depending upon the choice the verifier made, and then send that graph K. Now the prover's turn is going to respond by the prover is going to compare K with the two, one of the both of the original graphs. It's got to be isomorphic to one or the other, and it's going to report back which one. Just going to say, well, you picked G, no, or you picked H, because the prover with its unlimited capabilities can de determine that. Um, and then V accepts if the prover was right both times. Um, and if the pr prover was ever not right, the verifies as oh, something's fishy here, because we know that the prover has unlimited capability, so could get it right if you know um, if there was if this was an honest prover. Um, and so, um, if uh, if it's not getting it right, then the verify is going to reject. Uh, so, if the graphs are not isomorphic, the prover can tell which one it picked randomly. So, therefore, if the graphs are not isomorphic, the verifier with that that honest prover will accept with probability one, because the, that honest prover is always going to get the right answer which is at least two thirds is what the bound we need. Uh, we don't care about the space used in answer to a question. Um, if we were not in the language, so G and I H are not isomorphic, then there's nothing any crooked prover could possibly do because it, it gets a graph, can't tell, there's no way to tell whether it came from G or came from H. Um, so that, Crooked prover would have all, it could, the best thing it could do is guess. So it'd have 50% chance of answering correctly each time and only a 25% chance for doing it twice. And that's why I did it twice in order to get that error um, uh, to be small. So it's only a 25% chance of the prover getting lucky. So that would be an error case if the prover just by chance picked the, the right answer twice, even though the graphs were isomorphic. So therefore, for the isomorphic case, the verifier interacting with any prover is going to accept the input with at most one quarter, 25% of the time, which is less than a third. So those are, that's just to achieve that bound. 
Okay, so let's let's answer some questions first, and then I'll try to. Um, I'll, I'll, <laughs> uh, it, I'll ask you. You understand this? So this it's. I think it's worth trying to understand this model um, of this interactive proof system. It's a little little slippery, I, I realize, but um, uh, if you just hold your hold on to your intuition of the prover trying to convince, you know, a, a, you know, a powerful prover trying to convince a limited verifier um, of some string being in a language. Uh, you want the prover to be able to succeed when the string is in the language, but fail when the string is not in the language. Yes, we are going to, somebody's asking if the prover is identifying GRH by brute force. Yes, the prover is going to use its unlimited capabilities to determine given K, whether it came from G or H. The, um, the computational cost of the prover is irrelevant for this. It's just like when we think about a certificate, um, you know, for satisfiability, we don't talk about the cost of finding that certificate. Uh, for NP. For IP, again, we don't talk about the cost of the prover running. So somebody's asking, does the crooked pr prover answer just randomly or does, uh, can the cro crooked prover has, have a strategy? The crooked prover can have a strategy. No, we're, not, we're assuming the crooked prover is devious, but it's still going to fail. Okay, um, let's do the check-in. Suppose we change the model so that the prover can watch the verifier picking its random choices. So uh, the prover, the verifier cannot act in secret anymore, but the, the prover can watch the verifier. Now let's so suppose we had the same protocol that I just described. What language do we end up with? Is it the same language, different language? And what is that language? Okay, so I want to hopefully, um, let's let, let it'll, It'll give me some sense of how well you're following me by how well this uh, this goes. Yeah, someone's asking about how this connects up, for example, with NP. So we're going to look at that uh, also in a second. Okay, so this is reassuring that most of you, I think, are on the right track, at least for this check-in. Uh, do we assume P uses this access to guess right? What access? P is not really guessing. The P is tr is actually, I don't think a P is non-deterministic or anything like that. The P is actually trying to get the right answer and using its computational ability to do that if it's possible. It may not be possible, then there's nothing it can do. Okay, so let's uh, end this. Are you all in? Two seconds left. Please vote. Vote now or never. Okay, ending. Um, yeah, so C is the correct answer here. If the prover can watch what the verifier is doing, the prover can see what graph the verifier picked right from the beginning. And so the prover without having to do any work can say, you know, the prover looks over the verifier's shoulder and says, oh, you picked G and now you're randomly permuting it, but I don't care about that. I, just, I know you picked G, uh, so uh, the uh, proof is going to respond back uh, G, even if the graphs were isomorphic, the proof is going to be able to get the right answer. Kind of interestingly, um, uh, you can make a, you can change the protocol somewhat um, to make it uh, that even if the prover has access to the verifier's randomness, it can still achieve this, but not with the same protocol. Um, so that's a, that's a separate question. Um, okay, so let's move on here. I don't want to get too bogged down. Okay, here's another check-in. Um, uh, okay, so you have to tell me which of the following uh, statements are true, as far as you know. Now you have to think about a little bit how this these uh, relate to um, how NP and IP or BPP and IP relate to one another. Okay, how are we doing on this?
Okay, so we're gonna have to close this pretty soon too. Do the best you can. Interesting. Okay, closing up shop. Last, last vote. Okay, one, two, three. There's one more person out there who hasn't voted, who voted last time. Oh, well. Uh, all right. In fact, they're all true. Um, let's see, why is NP contained with IP, contained in IP? Uh, well, many of you have seen this already, so let's just quickly go through it. Um, if we just had a deterministic V, um, you know, the, uh, you can, uh, maybe it's just, is that, that can be enough of de deterministic V. I think it's just going to be equivalent, but actually just to be doubly sure, the deterministic V and the prover just sends a message to the verifier and then checks it. That's in the way we normally think about a certificate for NP. Uh, I don't think it's going to change anything, but should double check that if the verifier can still ask questions. But I think as long as the verifier is deterministic, you're going to get exactly NP here. Um, and um, now how about BPP? Well, there you don't even need a prover because the verifier is already probabilistic. So verifier can ignore the prover. And this one is a little tricky. Uh, IP contained in P space, because we haven't covered that. So there's no way for you to know that unless you happen to read ahead in the book. Uh, but it's in fact true. Um, in some ways, it's a little bit like um, the proof that uh, NP is contained in P space. IP is sort of an enhanced version of NP. And, you, and there's just a, basically a, uh, a P space brute force algorithm that goes through the entire tree of possibilities um, of the verifier and ex verifier with exchanges with the prover and can uh, determine that um, the verifier is either going to accept for some prover or is going to end up rejecting for every prover. Um, so we're not going to prove this statement, but something good for you to know anyway, that's just a fact. Uh, but we're going to do what the surprising thing in reference to part C is that the containment also goes the other way. This is the amazing, um, uh, uh, was, is an amazing result uh, that everything in P space you can do with in IP. So this is, IP is actually turns out to be incredibly powerful, it gives you everything in P space. You get IP equals P space. So that says that any problem that you can solve in P space, like any of the a game, for example, um, if you can imagine, you know, formulating, you know, checkers or chess as a P-space problem, which, you know, depending upon some details of the rules, you can do, because, you know, you have to generalize it to an end by end board, but okay, let, 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 let's not quibble. Um, uh, then uh, um, we don't know which side has a forced win in chess. Um, and even if somebody goes through the effort of going through the game tree um, and determines that, let's say, white has a forced win, uh, there's no way for them to, there's no short certificate. We don't know that that problem is not an NP. But uh, by going through an interactive proof, an all powerful prover could still convince somebody that white had a force, uh, you know, convince somebody in polynomial time that a, a white has a forced win, let's say in, um, in chess. Uh, again, little uh, stretching things because this is, uh, you know, you really need to talk about this as an N by N, not an eight by eight, but I think in this, the spirit is, is uh, fair. So, um, okay. Uh, so let's continue. So when we're not going to quite prove that, that P space is contained in IP, we're going to prove a somewhat weaker statement, but very similar, um, is that, uh, and, and historically came first, that co-NP is contained in IP. So not only is NP contained in IP, but we're going to prove that co-NP is contained in IP. And this actually has most of the, most of the idea for the P space being contained in IP. And itself, it's just an amazing proof, a little easier. Um, 
Okay. And th this was done, if I'm remembering, somebody's asking me when, how old is this? It's something in the 19, I think late 90s, but I'm not, I don't remember, but maybe early 90s. I think it's late 90s uh, when this was shown. Uh, so it's been a while now. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, so in terms of the relationship with cryptography, there were two parallel threads um, that both independently came up with the notion of an interactive proof system. Um, uh, I was a little bit personally involved with this in, in a way as well, but, but mainly that the, 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 there was one group in cryptography um, working on this, and there was another group who was actually coming out of the graph isomorphism world of working on it. And they, they came up with two separate models, one involving the private randomness and one involving the public randomness. Um, and it was turned out that was that, that they're actually in equivalent. Um, and uh, it's an interesting story, but unfortunately we don't have time for it. Uh, so why don't we move on? And I'm gonna start showing you how the proof that CoNP is contained in IP goes. And what we're gonna do is work with a problem that's a, almost like CoNP complete, but um, gonna be, uh, well, it's gonna be this number set problem. We'll, we'll see the connection with CoNP in a second. Uh, so CoNP, uh, so it's supposed to be exactly K satisfying assignments. Phi comma K is a set of pairs where the formula phi has exactly K satisfying assignments. So really this is a problem of counting how many satisfying assignments you have in a formula. Um, so you know for NP you have at least one, um, but I'm, I wanna know exactly how many. Uh, so the number set problem is the pairs, the formula and the count. So, um, and uh, so if we define the count number phi is the number of satisfying assignments of, of phi, um, then in another way of writing this uh, number sat problem is uh, the pairs phi k, where k is the number of satisfying assignments of phi. So we're gonna be using this notation number phi a lot. So just make sure you get you got that notation. This is the number of satisfying assignments of that formula. Okay. And here's a definition I probably should have given you earlier in the term, but better late than never. Um, uh, so the notion that a language is NP hard, it's like B NP complete, except without being necess without necessarily being in NP. So this is just the reduction part. A language is NP hard or co NP hard or P space hard or any of those other uh, classes that we've looked at. Um, if every problem in the class is reducible to that language, but you don't know whether this, that, that, that language is in the class. So we just call it NP hard instead of NP complete. Um, so you could say the language is NP complete if it's hard and it's in NP. Okay, and so we're gonna show that this number set problem is co-NP hard. So everything in co-NP is polynomial time reducible to number set. And that's easy. Because what we're gonna do is take a co-NP complete problem, which is the unsatisfiability problem, the complement of satisfiability, and show that reduces to the number set problem. And that's easy because a formula is unsatisfiable exactly when it has zero satisfying assignments. So if you can tell how many satisfying assignments something has exactly, or you can answer the question, you know, does a formula have exactly a thousand satis satisfying assignments? If you can do that in general, then you can solve CoNP. Uh, you can solve the unsatisfiability problem by asking if it's zero satisfying assignments, and that allows you to solve anything in CoNP. Okay, so we're gonna just work with this one problem, the number set problem, and show that that problem's in IP. Okay, let's take a quick break. 
Um, okay, feel free to send me, let me see if I can catch up with some of the questions that have been cropping up here. So if the prover knows the random choices of the verifier, can it can flip the answer to make the verifier reject? I'm not sure what that, you mean in the context just of the graphite somorphism problem or um, something in general? I'm not sure I, you'll have to explain. Sorry, I'll respond with a question mark. What else can I answer for you guys? So I got a question, might, if I P equals P space, does that mean that ISO or the or non ISO might be um, in uh, might be P space complete? But no, uh, that's not known. So we're about out of time. Okay. Let's continue here. Um, okay, so th this is where we're kind of getting, get, gonna start to get into the meat of things. Um, and if you didn't quite understand everything up till now, maybe just try to keep your intuition about how do I, you know, how does a, a powerful party convince a um, a polynomial, probabilistic polynomial time party of the number of satisfying assignments, an exact number, not, a, not, not at least, but you want to know exactly the number um, of satisfying assignments. Um, so it could be zero, for example. How do you convince, a, how do you convince um, someone that there are zero assignments? And, and, the, and the, the, you, know, you can have an interaction which does that, and that's not obvious at all. How are you going to do that? Um, uh, all right. So, um, okay. So we're going to have to introduce some notation, which don't, I hope it doesn't cause heartburn here. Uh, so we'll, let's say, again, here is the, the, the computational, the language we're working with number set. And we have, a uh, phi with a has m variables, x1 to xm. Now, here's the notation. I'm gonna, if I write phi with a z, free, phi of zero, that just means the formula that I get by plugging in zero for x1 and leaving all the rest of the variables uh, alone. Okay, so I substitute zero for x1, where zero means false and one means true as usual. And but that's the, it's going it's still going to be some other formula, but just with that substitution. If I write phi zero one, that means I've preset the first two variables to zero and one. Um, if I write phi with a bunch of preset values, I'm just setting the first i variables x one to x i to some values, um, and leaving the other variables as unset. So I'm calling the ones that I'm nailing in there, as I'm already saying, these are the presets. Okay, so this is just converting some formulas into other formulas that have somewhat fewer variables. All right, um, now let's recall that number notation, the number sign notation, number phi is the number of satisfying assignments. Now, if I say number phi of zero, that's the number of satisfying assignments when I've preset x1 to zero. Similarly, if I preset the first i variables to some values, and then I take, I want to take how many, how many satisfying assignments subject to those prefit, presets, I write it this way. So I'm going to use this notation a lot. You have to understand this notation. Ask if you don't know, if you don't get it. So another way of writing it, I don't know if this is helpful, but another way of writing number phi of a1 to ai, remember we have m variables altogether. That means I take the variables which I have not yet preset um, and I allow them to range over all possible zeros and ones and I add up the, the formulas values for all of those. So 
there's a one every time I satisfy and a zero every time I don't satisfy. So I'm adding up all the satisfying assignments subject to these I presets. Okay. So here are two critical facts about this number sign notation. First of all, if I preset the first I values to something, now I can, in addition, set the next variable either to zero or to one, and I get this relationship, which is just simply a generalization of the fact that the total number of satisfying assignments of the formula is equal to the number of satisfying assignments when x1 is zero plus the number of satisfying assignments when x1 is one. Right, they together have to add up to the total number because x1 is going to be the either zero or one. So that's fact number one. Fact number two is that if I preset everything, all of the variables, so there are no variables left, then the number of satisfying assignments subject to that preset of everything is just whether or not I've satisfied the formula, which is the value of the formula on that those presets. Okay, both two simple facts, but it's gonna be critical in the protocol I'm about to describe. Questions on this? I think I actually I do have a question for you. So let's just see. What do you think? Just to check your understanding. Okay. Got about 80% getting this. Um, I'm not sure that's good, but. Uh... All right, almost done. Closing. Okay. Okay, so uh, yes, A is the correct answer. You know, if, if there are nine satisfying assignments altogether and there are six satisfying assignments where the first variable is set to zero, then there's only three satisfying assignments where the first variable is set to one because nine has got to be equal to six plus three. That's actually this fact number one. It's not gonna be 15. This is not true either. So it's just A. Okay. Okay, so let's try to, with, with that knowledge, let's try to see how we can put number sat in IP. So this is not gonna quite work, but it's really gonna set us up to do this, to finish this next time. Um, so you might immediately see where this is going wrong, but you'll, <laughs> you'll have to put up with it because um, I, the setup is what's important. Um, okay, so understand now. Here's the here's the the setup. We have um, the input is a formula and a number, where that number is supposed to be the number of satisfying assignments. You know, it could be wrong, and in which case we're not in the language. Um, but if it's right, you're in the language. So. The prover is supposed to convince the verifier that it's correct if it is correct. And it's not gonna, it's gonna fail no matter what it tries to do if it's uh, not correct. So this is so the prover is gonna send, first of all, um, so, the, so the prover is gonna send a claim about the number of satisfying assignments. Gonna send, uh, no, when I say, this value here, this is what the prover, um, if it's honest, is gonna send the right value. Of course, the verifier does not know if the prover is honest, but I'm describing how the honest prover is gonna operate. And we'll have to understand what happens if the prover tries to cheat. So the prover is gonna send, the honest prover is gonna send the number of satisfying assignments altogether. And the prover verifier just makes sure that that matches up with the input. If it doesn't match up with the input, I, the verifier is just going to, you know, you know, the, the, the verifier is going to not be convinced that the input is um, in the language. So it's going to just uh, reject at that point. Um, okay. Uh, 
Then now the verifier says, okay, that was very good that you sent me this. How do I know that's right? So what the verif prover is gonna do to try to convince the verifier that this value was correct is uh, unravel that by one level. By say, well, you know, there were nine satisfying assignments altogether. Uh, six of them were when, the, when x1 is zero and three of them were when x1 is one. To verify, what does the verifier have to check? That these add up correctly. When I preset x1 to zero and to one, it had better add up to the total number of satisfying assignments. If that works out, the verifier is happy. It's still being, it's still consistent with being convinced that this k was the right value. Um, so um, the next step is, well the, well, the verifier says, well, how do I know those two values are correct? The prover says, okay, well, I'm gonna send, un unravel them one level further. Um, then here's the number of satisfying assignments. When the next variable is set to both possibilities for each of the possibilities of the first variable. Now, you, if you're understanding me about what the prover is sending, you should start to be getting a little nervous because something is, I mean, this is gonna be correct but it's gonna start, it looks like it's starting to blow up in terms of the number of amount of work that's involved. And that's actually a problem, but let's bear with that for the moment. Let's just worry about correctness, not about complexity for the moment. So the proof is gonna now send the number of satisfying assignments for each of those four possible ways of presetting the first two variables. And the verifier is gonna check that that was consistent with the information the prover sent in the previous round, right? By again, checking this identity here. So then the prover is gonna continue our doing that until it's, got, it's done that through M rounds where M is the number of variables. So at this point, um, the prover is gonna send uh, all possible ways of presetting all of the variables. So then now there's two to the M possibilities here. Again, this is hopelessly not allowed, but okay, ignoring that. The prover's got to use this at the nth round to check what happens at the, at the previous round. So that, that's when there were M minus one values sent because each one has one more, uh, uh, you're extending the presets by one. So which using this to check that the previous round was values were correct. So it's looking for, um, you know, the M minus one presets have to add up correctly, um, you know, in terms of the M, the presets of M uh, values uh, for each of those ways of uh, doing those uh, M minus one presets. And so now the prover has sent all of those two to the M counts, which are by the way, ones and zeros, because at this point we have preset all of the va va values of the variables. And so there's only one possible assignment at most that there can be. Um, and now the verifier, the prover is done. The verifier is gonna check by itself that these values make sense, that these values are correct. So it's gonna do that by looking back at the formula. So far up until this point, the verifier has not been looking at the formula, it's just been checking the internal consistency of the prover's messages with each other. But now at the end, the verifier is gonna take the messages, these, these values that the prover sent for each of the two to the M presets and see if it matches up with what the formula would do. Remember that was the other sort of the base case of the, 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 the fact number two um, from the uh, slide or two ago. Um, make sure that these agree. Okay, and now the verifier says, well, okay, if everything has checked out and all of these are, are, are in agreement, then the verifier is uh, gonna be convinced that, um, the, that uh, fee had K satisfying assignments. But if anywhere along the way, one of these checks fails, 
the prover is not the verifier is not going to be convinced and it's going to reject. Okay, so in a sense, this is kind of dopey. You know, you know, we've just I'm just kind of giving you a, a complicated way of just counting up one by one each of the satisfying assignments of the formula and seeing if that matches K. Um, but nevertheless, this way of looking at it is going to be uh, help us to understand um, the way to fix this. So, so bear with me for another minute on this one. So, another way of looking at this, which I, I think is 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 particularly useful, is to think of what happens. Well, okay. We'll get there in a second. Um, I want to look at what happens if K was wrong. But before I do that, let's look at the. Look, I'm going to give a kind of a graphic, a, a graphical view of um, the information that the prover sends and the and the verifier's actions in this protocol. So the the values that the prover sending are going to be in yellow. So the uh, and and the information that the verifier has or checks is going to be in white. So the, the verifier has the K, the, the input value, uh, which is supposed to be the number of satisfying assignments. And the prover sends some value and the verifier checks that this value, which is supposed to be the number of satisfying assignments corresponds with K. So that's one of the checks it does. Then the prover is gonna send, kind of take that to justify this value, it um, sends, the number of satisfying assignments when you have x1 set to zero or set to one, the verifier adds those up to give you, to, to, and it's supposed to equal the total number of satisfying assignments. And so this is, if you understood this protocol, this is just, I'm writing it out in a sort of a simplified way, perhaps. Okay. And so um, keeps checking that these things add up correctly until you get down to um, setting all m values in all two to the m possible ways. And now the verifier is going to then check to make sure that that equals the, what the formula would say. Um, okay. Okay. So now let's, what happens if K was the wrong value? It did not agree with the number of satisfying assignments. Um, and what does, what happens now, um, uh, could the prover, what happens if the prover tries to make the verifier accept anyway? So, um, so the only thing the prover can do at the very first step, uh, would be to lie, um, about, you know, if the prover sends the, if K is wrong and the prover, prover sends the correct value for uh, the, the, the total count, the verifier is going to reject. So I'm trying to see, is, could the prover try to make the verifier accept what, what happens? So the prover has to lie here. And I'm going to indicate that by saying the prover is sending in uh, the wrong value for, um, uh, the, the total count. Well, if the prover is going to lie here, um, then just like, you know, if you, you know, you have a child who um, tells a lie and then you start, you know, as the parent, you start asking questions to try to see if the story is consistent. One lie is going to lead to another lie. Um, and that's what happens here. If the, uh, in order to justify this lie, um, the, the proof is going to have to a lie in one, or perhaps both, but at least one of the, these two values, because you can't have the two correct values adding up to the incorrect value. Okay, so you have to think about what's going on here. So if, if this is a lie that's going to force a lie at one, of the, one side or the other, one level down, which is then going to force a lie to propagate down. And so there's a lie at every stage is going to force a lie at least in one way, one place or another 
to propagate all the way down to the bottom. And at the bottom, the verifier will see that the check doesn't work as when it, when it tries to connect it up with the formula itself and the form ver verifier will reject. Okay, so just a way of looking at this. Um, if the form, if the value, if the, if the input was not in the language. Um, so, uh, but the problem is that, as I said, that this is exponential. So how are we gonna fix that? So just looking ahead to what we're gonna do on Tuesday. Um, okay, let's see if there's any questions here, first of all. Uh, okay, you're, I got a question, should this be, uh, should this be M minus, I, I purposely made this bracket only go, not include the very last zero. Yeah, there's a total of M zeros here altogether, but the, the I left out the last zero. That's why I said N minus my, one. Maybe it would have been better to say M. Um, Okay, so and you got a, another interesting question here. Why can't we reject right away if K is wrong? Um, uh, well, the verifier is probabilistic polynomial time. How does the verifier know if K is wrong? Um, so I mean, or, 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 or right. So what, what we're trying to do is something like, you know, like NP where we have a certificate but now we have this kind of interactive certificate in the form of this prover. Maybe that's another way to look at it. Um, where if you're in the language, there should be some way for the prover to convince you, to get, make you accept. But if you're not, not in the language, there should be no way to, for the ver prover to make you accept. Um, uh, so the verifier just can't reject right away because there's no way to tell. How does the verifier know? It's gonna start rejecting things when it shouldn't if it's just gonna be rejecting willy-nilly here. Um, okay, how does the verifier need to determine if the prover is internally consistent instead of just asking? So why does the verifier need to determine if the prover is internally consistent instead of just asking the questions in step M plus one? Yeah, so maybe that's because it, it looks like all of the work is happening at the very end. Um, but I'm really presenting this to you as a preparation for what we're going to do on Tuesday. Um, so it's important to think about the connection from each step to the next. Each step is going to be justified by what happens at the next step until we get to the very end. So you have to just understand it for what it is. Um, don't try to make it more efficient. Yeah, I realize this is kind of dumb. Um, Good point. We're not using the probabilism here. Um, and moreover, we're not really even using the interaction here. The prover is doing all the sending. The verifier is just accepting at the end. Yeah, this is, we're not using the power and we're getting a weaker result. So let's move on before we run out of time here. So how are we gonna fix this? So the problem is this blowing up. Each, to justify each stage where each value where um, uh, needing to present two values which add up to it. Um, and that's uh, going, leading to a blow up. Now it would be nice if we can do something where each value was supported by just a single value at the next level. So you know, here's an idea. What, you know, in order to understand, to see that, uh, that that this total count is correct, why don't we just pick at random either zero or one and only follow that one down? Well, the problem with doing that is because the, 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 the sequence of lies is, could be just a single path through this uh, tree. And the chances you're gonna find that path down to a contradiction at the bottom is very low if you're just doing it at random. Um, so just randomly picking zeros and ones as, as, the, as the one you're gonna justify, use to justify the previous value is not gonna be good enough. 
So what, but, but this is what we're gonna do. However, the values that we're gonna pick for, um, for these random um, inputs are not gonna be Boolean values. We're gonna pick non-Boolean assignments to the va variables, which again, just as with the branching program case, didn't make any sense on the surface of it, we're gonna to have to make it make sense. And we'll have to see how to do that on Tuesday, in Tuesday's lecture. Okay, so that's kind of the setup. Okay. Um, yeah, so in a similar question, why is this any different from just not deterministically guessing the assignments. It's because of this, we're really setting the stage. Okay, so what we did today was we introduced the, the, the model and defined the complexity class. We, com we did show this one in, in its full glory. We showed that non-ISO is an IP. Really worth understanding this uh, protocol here, making sure you, you're, you're comfortable with that. And, the, and also the, the model itself. And so for Tuesday's lecture, we're gonna finish this up. Uh, we're gonna, well, we started showing that number set is an IP, which is what we need to, to do to prove co -NP is an IP. And we'll finish that um, next time, which will be our last time. Okay, so that's it for today. I'll stick around for questions. So a good question here, why can't um, V just reject if some of the checks are incorrect. Yes, V could, as soon as there's a check that fails, V can just reject at that stage. I'm just trying to argue that at some point along the way, if the input is not in the language, there's gonna be a check that fails. So, I mean, I said reject at the end, but yeah, I mean, you could re have rejected at any point at, uh, along the way. Um, Okay. Um, uh, somebody's asking for what what role did I play? Uh, so I did my, my my own personal role in this. I were were two was was twofold. First of all, I I came up with the idea uh, of well, not the idea. I came up with the name Interactive Proof. Uh, I remember when Silvio Macali was explaining this to me in my apartment uh, many many years ago. He had a kind of a little bit complicated, and I, I don't even remember what the protocol was for. It was not for something simple, it was something involving uh, prime numbers. And I said, oh, that's a kind of an interactive proof. And, and it, it stuck from that point on. So um, that was one thing. But the other thing in terms of ma ma more mathematically, I, my role was, so uh, uh, Shafi Goldwasser and I proved the equivalence of the two models the public coin and the private coin version. Um, so that, that was uh, my, uh, my role in this, that back in when this was all first coming out. I proved it, uh, proved it on an airplane on the way to a conference somewhere. Anyway, so I think we're gonna, unless there's any other questions, I think we'll head out. Take care, everybody. Uh, see, you on, see you on Tuesday. Bye-bye.